Well, good morning, everyone. To those of you in the building here and also joining us online, it's good that we can meet and worship our God this morning. Uh, all I'm going to do is introduce our good friend, uh, Gordon Frame. He's doing the series of three. He was here last week, this week, and then next week uh, from uh, York Evangelical Church. Thank you again for coming, uh, Gordon. I'm going to hand over to you. Welcome to everybody here from me as well, those of you in the hall and those of you who are at home. It's getting to be uh, regular now after last week and uh, Janet and I were here for the uh, conference yesterday as well. So we did think of bringing a camp bed and putting it down in the lounge, but uh, very kindly uh, Colin and Judith uh, gave us a bed for last night so we didn't have to do the uh, journey from York twice. So. Uh, uh, it's great to be with you here again and to share together in God's Word. Let me read uh, a couple of verses to begin with from the beginning of uh, the letter to the Hebrews, which we'll be in quite a bit today. Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4, where the Lord Jesus is praised in this way. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so we're going to continue to praise the Lord Jesus as we sing together, Jesus is King. Let's come before this God now and let us 
praise him in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this opportunity to gather together in the name of our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for every Sunday. We thank you that it reminds us that it was on this day that the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead. So that in a sense, every Sunday is a resurrection Sunday. And all we thank you, our Heavenly Father, that we are able uh, to meet together in this way. Uh, we thank you for those who are well enough to be here. We thank you also, Lord, for the um, wonders of the technology that allows people who cannot be here uh, to join us uh, still live and feel part uh, of this meeting. So thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that you have given us the uh, physical ability to be here. But Lord, even more than that, we thank you that you have given us the desire in our hearts to be there. And we acknowledge straight away that that is not something natural. Many of us can remember a time in our lives where we would not have chosen uh, to gather together on the Lord's Day. And Lord, there are so many other options before people today. But Lord, you have moved in our hearts and you have said on the Lord's Day, let's come together with our brothers and sisters, with those seeking after you. And let us come to hear from your word, to hear from what you have to say to us, and to come and bring our praise and our glory to you. So Lord, thinking of the verses that we read and the song that we've just been singing, we want to extol and glorify and honour the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, when you were on earth, radiated the Father's glory, that in human nature you represented him exactly. And yet we thank you, Lord, though you appeared in human form, yet you are the one who sustains this whole universe by your powerful word. We thank you that you provided purification for sins by your death on the tree at Calvary. And we thank you that at the end of that, you could say it is finished, that the work of redemption is over. And when you return to glory, you could sit at the right hand of the majesty on high that that part of your priestly work was over. And yet we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you continue to act as our high priest, interceding for us as we were singing day by day. You know our situations. You know our needs. You know our temptations. And Lord, you pray for us. We thank you that you are the Holy One. We thank you that you are Jesus, our Saviour. And so we want to come before you and worship you today. Would you help us to do that in spirit and in truth? Lord, some of us may come this morning with joyous and glad hearts uh, for the week that is behind us. Others may come heavy-hearted but Lord, we pray that you will enable us all to bring that sacrifice of praise to you. And as we come before you, we also want to confess our sins before you. Lord, we are not perfect by any means. Lord, even those who have been believers many years, even in the last week, we have thought, we have said, we have done things which even we feel embarrassed about and yet Lord uh, you who are the perfect holy one uh, know the depth of our hearts and you have loved us nevertheless so Lord we bring uh, these uh, failings of ours before you and we ask that in Jesus name you would forgive them and we thank you Lord 
that you are a God of forgiveness and that you have promised that those who come with sincerity of heart, trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus, you will pour out your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness upon us. And so we ask for that once again this morning as we bring our praise and our prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, read uh, another little passage from uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 23. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Well, we're going to sing it again now, Through All Life's Sorrows, then Hannah is going to bring uh, the children's talk.
the children's way. <laughs> We all got a chair. That's good. So, what song have we been singing? Yes, we've been practicing this morning, although Daddy has not been helping by telling you the wrong words to us. <laughs> We're going to do the right words now, okay? So, where do we start? Heads. With our heads. Great. Great. We're going to go. Three, two, one. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, and eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Great! And can anybody remember why we've been singing that song? Why have we been singing this song, Susie? Yeah, that's right. We've been learning and remembering amazing things about Jesus that are linked to that song with heads and shoulders and knees and toes. Great. And last week we were thinking about eyes and the story of Zacchaeus up in that tree and how Jesus, he sees us as we really are and yet he still wants to know us and to help us and to rescue us. So what comes after eyes in the song? No, not toes. <laughs> What's after eyes? Eyes and ears. ears. Right, we're going to be thinking about ears. What amazing thing about Jesus can we be thinking about when we think about ears? Well, before we read a story from the Bible, I want us to think, what happens if you are watching your favourite show on the TV? Something really exciting is about to happen. And then your mummy or your daddy comes in and they say, you need to tidy up. Or, you need to come for tea. Now, if we're being very good, we might be like, okay, mummy, daddy, yep, that's fine, off we go, do that. But inside, what might we be thinking? We might be thinking, shh, I'm busy. I'm listening to this over here. I don't want to listen to you over there because I'm busy listening to this over here and this is more important to me. My TV show, more important. So, shh. <laughs> Or what about if we're listening to somebody read us a story and somebody else, our brother or sister, our friend, comes up and interrupts us and they want to know the answer to a question. What might we be tempted to say? We might be tempted to say, shh, I'm listening to the story. Don't interrupt me. Well, in the story we're going to look at in the Bible today, some people are saying shh to somebody because they think, He's just interrupting everything. They think he's not very important. They think he just needs to be quiet, okay? So when we get to that part of the story, can you all do a big shush for me? Can you practice? Shh. Yeah. Good stuff. So this is a story about Bartimaeus. I'm going to try and read it upside down. This might not go well. Bartimaeus was blind. He couldn't see anything. His eyes didn't work. He couldn't see any of the wonderful things that we see. Bartimaeus couldn't see the road, so his friends had to hold his hands and show him where to walk. Every day, Bartimaeus walked with his friends to a place outside the city gate. Bartimaeus sat down there, and he begged the people who passed by to give him money. So Bartimaeus sitting outside the city where lots of people would walk and asking people to help him. I'm a poor blind man, Bartimaeus said. I cannot see to do work and earn money. Will you help me? So that's what Bartimaeus is sat there asking people. <coughs> One day, there were a lot of people passing by Bartimaeus. They bumped into him and they made lots of noise. What's going on? Bartimaeus wondered aloud. His friends told him, Jesus is coming down the road. Bartimaeus was excited to hear that Jesus was coming. He started crying out, Jesus, help me. His friends were embarrassed. They told Bartimaeus to be quiet. Shh, can you do a big shush? Shh. But Bartimaeus kept shouting louder and louder and louder. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. And what were all his friends saying? Shh. They didn't get 
think the house things that Bartimaeus is crying out, they don't think Jesus will want to listen to him. Jesus stopped. He called Bartimaeus over and asked, how can I help you? Bartimaeus answered, I want to see. Jesus can heal people. So Jesus said, Bartimaeus, you can see. Right away, Bartimaeus' eyes were healed. Bartimaeus started walking down the road following Jesus. He no longer needed friends to help him, sorry, friends to hold his hand. Jesus had healed him. So all of Bartimaeus' friends, when Bartimaeus was crying out to Jesus as Jesus passed, they were like, don't say that, Bartimaeus. Shh. Jesus won't be interested in you. Shh. Jesus has got more important things to do. He doesn't want to listen to you. Shh. Shh. Yeah. But Jesus stopped. Jesus came and talked to Bartimaeus. And this tells us something amazing about what Jesus does with his ears. Jesus listens to people who need help. He listened to Bartimaeus and he helped him, didn't he? And that means that we can cry out to Jesus just like Bartimaeus did. We might not be blind like Bartimaeus was, but we can cry out to Jesus. We can say, Jesus, I'm lonely. Please help me. Jesus, I'm sad. Please help me. Jesus, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Please help me. And Jesus will listen to us. He's not too busy. He's not too important. Jesus loves to listen to people. But first, we need to cry out to Jesus and we need to say something really important. We need to say to Jesus, Jesus, help me and rescue me. We need to say to Jesus, I need you to forgive me for my sins. And Jesus always listens to people who cry out that to him. Great. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to sing again, aren't we? We're going to start again with our heads. We're going to go. One, two. Oh, is Sophie back? Got to go. One, two, three. Head, shoulders, knees and toes. Knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes. Knees and toes. Eyes and ears and Great, thanks for listening guys, you can go back to your seat. So we've got the reading now from Hebrews chapter 7 verse 23. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from, continu from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which comes after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Well, let's sing together once again before we come to consider that part that Joe's just read for us and other parts of Hebrews, thinking of Jesus the priest. We're going to sing together, There is a Hope.
Well, and we're going to be continuing this morning in the little mini-series that we began uh, last week. I'll just wait till the exodus has taken place. And we're going to be considering this morning, as we think of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to be thinking of him in his role as being our priest. And um, we're going to base it partly on that uh, reading that Joe read for us a little bit earlier, but we are going to spread about in different parts of Hebrews as well. Uh, But you should find most of the verses I'm going to refer to will come up on the screen for you. So just a quick reminder of where this fits in from last week. We began to look at the three officers of Jesus, which didn't mean sort of places in a building that he was meeting in, you know, uh, at different points uh, in the year, but the the three roles uh, that he took. And we we saw last week that there were three roles in particular of prophet, priest, and king. And obviously today it's the central one of those that are priests that we're going to consider. These were, as we said last week, the three distinctive Officers of Israel, uh, the people who were prophets, priests, and kings, would be anointed with oil. But in general, um, people did not, uh, if you like, have more than one role. But in Jesus, all three of these roles coalesce in him. And again, as we said last week, for those of us who like a bit of alliteration, Millard Erickson helped with revealing... uh, referring to these as Jesus' as revealing, reconciling, and ruling roles. So, as our prophet, he reveals God's mind to us. As God's king, as we'll discover next week, he rules over us. But as the high priest, he was reconciling us to God. And uh, the writer of the Hebrews is very keen to show to these these Jewish converts who were being tempted to revert to the the comfort blanket of Judaism, which some of their friends sadly had already done, with all of their externals, he was trying to show to them that Jesus is superior and Jesus is everything that they need. So last week we saw that Jesus' teaching was superior to that of the prophets. So this morning we're going to see that his priestly work, the work that he did as a priest, is superior to that of any previous high priest that they had had. And they had had, it's very easy, isn't it, to think of the poor examples of high priests in Jesus' own lifetime. But there have been many high priests in the past who had served faithfully um, to Israel. But the writer of the Hebrews is keen on showing that Jesus is superior even to the best of them. So let's consider for a moment what the high priest actually did. And three of the functions of the high priest in the Old Testament were as follows. They offered sacrifices on behalf of the people. Day after day, there were hundreds of sacrifices that were made in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. All sorts of sacrifices, burnt offerings, sin offerings, and so on. And the second function of these priests was they were seeking to bring the people near to God. God in all his majesty and purity uh, was not easy for a sinful person to approach. So one of the functions of the priests was to bring the people near to God. And then the third thing that they did for them was that they prayed for the people. They interceded to God on their behalf. So what I want to try to do this morning is show how the writer of the Hebrews shows Jesus 
being superior in all of those areas. And first of all, then, Jesus' sacrifice is a superior sacrifice than any that the high priests could make. And uh, I think we've got uh, four ways in which we show Jesus' sacrifice to be superior. And the first one was this, that he was the one who not only made the offering, but of course he was the offering himself. He didn't just make it, he became the sacrifice. And no high priest in the past could ever do that. So in chapter 9 and verse 26, we read this. He has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He came at the end of the ages, not only to make sacrifices, but to give himself as a sacrifice for sin. And nobody else could possibly do that. So that was something that he could do and did do that no other priest could do. But there was something he didn't need to do that every priest had to do. And that was this. He did not have to make sacrifice on behalf of his own sins. The high priest, whenever they began the day's work, of making sacrifice on behalf of the people, the first thing that they would do was to make a sacrifice for themselves because they were sinful people themselves and they knew that. But in that uh, passage that Joel read for us, we, we read this. Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He didn't have to do that. And the reason he didn't have to do that was that he had no sin of his own that had to be uh, dealt with. So uh, he was unlike the priests in that way. And of course, with his sacrifice, he shed his own blood. And that was incredibly superior to any of the sacrifices that the others could make. So a third point here was that his blood was infinitely more efficacious. You know, it had more power in taking away sin than that of bulls and goats. Bulls, goats were uh, among the regular things that were sacrificed under the old covenants. And if we were to move on further and look at uh, chapter 10, the, the writer makes this remarkable claim. He says, in, in the end, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And in actual fact, the fact that this was being repeated day after day after day actually suggested that they couldn't be finally taking away sin or there wouldn't be any need to be doing it again. But Jesus' blood is very much different to all the blood that had been shed over the centuries before. In the, in the first chapter of Revelation, as uh, uh, John is uh, writing there, he says this of Jesus. He says, He has freed us from our sins by His blood. The blood of bulls and goats in the end could not take away sin, but He has freed us 
from our sins by his blood. And then the fourth thing, showing that Jesus' sin uh, sacrifice was superior, is this. His sacrifice need not and could not be repeated. As we said, there was this constant, unending cycle of sacrifices throughout the old covenant period. But the writer of the Hebrews stresses that Jesus' sacrifice was once. It could only be made once. It need only be made once. In chapter 7 and verse 27, he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And in chapter 9, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. So in all of these ways, in these four ways, Jesus' sacrifice is shown to be far superior. The sacrifice that he as priest made was far superior to that which has gone before. I wonder if you have, um, I wonder if you have favorite Christian books which, if you like, you know, alongside the Bible, you really wouldn't want to be without. Um, that might be an interesting discussion over your coffees afterwards. Uh, I must admit that uh, Jim Packer's Knowing God has been one that I read as a fairly young Christian and one I've gone back to and, and, and read again and again. And uh, when, when our son went off to Japan for three months. I, I sent him with my copy of it, and it came back having read it, but it also came back with some fair holes in it. Apparently, there was a, a, an animal in one of the houses that he was who'd got a hold of it. But anyway, it, it was dog-eared in more ways than one, but he loved that book as well. I suppose that's a, that's a favourite one. But another favourite one of mine, and my daughter tells me I'm very sad, to have this really as a favourite Christian book. Um, I was given it to some years ago by another church, which, uh, which was lovely to receive, and it's got the exciting title of The Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. <laughs> and you can see why my daughter says I was rather sad for having that as one of my favourite books. But I do, I absolutely love it. And I, I just love going, looking at various images that are in the Bible and drawing them together and reading it. And it, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery gave this lovely summary of the superiority of Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, and it says this, in contrast to the law-ordained, sin-tainted, perpetual and numerous sacrifices of the Old Testament priests. Jesus was the sinless offerer of his sinless self once and for all on behalf of his people. And I just think that sums up what I've been trying to say over the last few minutes beautifully. In contrast to the law-ordained, sin-tainted, perpetual and numerous sacrifices of the Old Testament priests, Jesus was the sinless offerer of his sinless self once and for all on behalf of his people. So Jesus' sacrifice was superior, but the second area that the high priest was involved in was giving the people an access to God. So let's look at two verses from our reading and another one. Joe read for us a little bit earlier, Hebrews 1 and 2. And uh, the writer there says, Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. 
and a little bit later in chapter 9, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Now, I, I'm, I'm not terrible in buying gifts for birthdays and Christmases. I'm not one of those people who, who always forgets them and, and is always late. In fact, we've already begun picking up one or two things for next Christmas in the sales in January and February, you know, like to get ahead. But I remember just on one occasion, I was trying to get something through the internet um, for one of the grandchildren and it became evident as the birthdays came near it, it wasn't going to arrive on time. Now, I could have just gone and got something else, but I thought this was something they, that they would really want. So I just thought, well, what can I do? So what I did in the end is I, 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 took, a, I took a copy, I took, a, I took a, a screenshot of what I was getting them, did it as a photo, and I put that in an envelope, so on the morning, that's what they got, the photo of it. Now, it wasn't great, let's be honest, you know, you, you couldn't really write on that photograph. It wasn't great, but it, it, it was the promise of something better that was to come, and, and the present did, in the end, come. And, and I think you see that, really, with the service of the high priest in the earthly tabernacle contrasted to Jesus' service for us in heaven. So, earthly high priests served in an earthly tabernacle and they entered the Holy of Holies once a year. So the high priest served in the tabernacle, one that was made with human hands, though it was made very, very carefully under very, very specific instructions from God, and later they would do so in the temple as well. But in terms of actual access to the very presence of God, just once each year, those devout worshippers waited patiently 90 feet away as the high priest entered the Holy of Holies. Remember, the Holy of Holies was right at the centre, right at the heart of the tabernacle or the temple. And that represented the place where God was there in his presence. And the priests would enter that Holy of Holies on behalf of all the people whose names, the names of the tribes, were inscribed on gemstones that were sewn inside their robes. And the, the people were, you know, waited for him to reappear. And it was a tremendous day for them as they thought the priests had gone into the very presence of God and represented them. But, says the writer of the Hebrews, Jesus serves in heaven itself. And he is eternally in the heavenly sanctuary. So in contrast to the perishable, ever on the move earthly tabernacle, Jesus serves now in heaven, seated in the place of privilege, in the presence of his Father, continually on our behalf, not just once a year, but continually on our behalf. A man called uh, Philip Edgecombe Hughes said this, he, Jesus, left heaven as Lord, but he returned to heaven both as Lord and also as minister on our behalf in the presence of of the Father. So Jesus is there on our behalf continually. But then even more remarkably, and we read this a little bit earlier in the meeting, 
Jesus says that he can give us direct access into the sanctuary. We don't have to stand 90 feet away waiting for somebody else on our behalf. Let's just read uh, Hebrews 10, 19 to 22 again. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Do you remember that when Jesus was on the cross, various physical miracles happened? The earthquake, the, the, the sun going down and darkness appearing. But another remarkable thing, the temple curtain was rent, we're told, torn from top to bottom. And this was no flimsy little curtain. This was a thick, long curtain and it was the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple so that no one should appear come into the presence of God lest they be destroyed. But when Jesus died, the curtain was rent. It was torn from top to bottom, signifying that even people like you and me could enter the most holy holy place we didn't have to wait for the high priest once a year we can come into the presence of the holy god and not be destroyed because as we come in the name of jesus through his blood we can be accepted in the beloved we can come with boldness in the blood of christ we can have access through the indestructible life of Jesus, knowing that we are represented there by his priesthood. So superior sacrifice, superior access, finally superior intercession. The high priest used to pray for the people. Because he is God's perfect son, who has made the perfect sacrifice, Jesus' Father always hears his prayers. There's a point, I don't know if you remember it, when um, Lazarus had died and Jesus was knew that he was going to bring him back to life. And he prayed to the Father before he did so. And he explained to the people, or he explained in his prayer, he says, you know, Father, I know that you always hear me. In a sense, I'm saying this so that the people around about me can realize that as well. Father, he said, I know that you always hear me. And by saying that, Jesus isn't just saying that his father, you know, had, if you like, ears to hear. But by hearing, he, he always hears and answers him as well. And of course, because he is now in heaven, Jesus can respond simultaneously to all of our needs, which he understands perfectly because he has lived this human life. I mean, it, it's, it's just mind-boggling, isn't it, to think of the billions of people who are on earth. Think of the millions of people we're not just gathered for worship like this today, but who are giving individual prayers to God. And yet God is able, Jesus is able to simultaneously hear them all. And because his is an eternal priesthood, our reading began with saying yeah, the priesthood had to change, the priests had to change because they died. But Jesus being an eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek, his priesthood is permanent, irrevocable, then there is no ending to his prayers for us. So Paul writing to the uh, Romans could say, Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God 
and is interceding for us. The writer of the Hebrews we read earlier, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He always lives. I, I just wonder something, do we always grasp that? That it's not just the Jesus of history, but it is Jesus who is alive today. I, I, I remember when I, was, when I was first converted, it was in the early 1970s, and some of you will remember um, people like Arthur Blessed, who was around then, who carried a cross all around the country and so on. And, and stickers appeared all over the place. Well, I, I, I'd been converted in, in, in another church in, in, in Newcastle, but I remember going back to the, the church where, where, where my mom went to and where I'd sort of gone, which was still quite a liberal church at the time. And I remember going there in a, in a, a green basketball vest with uh, my hair down to about here and with these stickers in a cross shape on my vest and these stickers said Jesus is alive and my mom probably died a thousand deaths of embarrassment and, but you know that this is what just had struck me what had hit me which I realized for the first time in my life Jesus is not just some teacher in past history but Jesus is alive He's resurrected, he's exalted, he's alive in heaven, and he is praying and interceding for us. And I think that word intercession, sometimes people think of Jesus' intercession as him, if you like, only presenting his sacrifice to the Father on our behalf. Now, if it was only that, it would be glorious. But I think it's more than I think he does intercede for us personally about our personal needs. That, that Greek word that is translated into sessions is used elsewhere. For example, when, when Festus um, were, were, was speaking to Agrippa, he said, the whole Jewish community petitioned me. It's the same word that's translated in the session. That means they came with their particular complaints about Paul. So I think Jesus intercedes particularly for us, not just generally. But when you've got, a, when you've got an operation coming up and you're frightened about it, Jesus prays for it. When you are tempted to slide back because the Christian path is just proving really hard this month, Jesus knows it and he prays for you. So isn't that a tremendous thought and encouragement for us that Jesus knows you and me individually and he intercedes for us. Wayne Gruden put it like this, Jesus continually lives in the presence of God to make specific requests and to bring specific petitions before God on our behalf. So how would they respond to these things? That Jesus, as the high priest, has made the superior sacrifice, that he gives us superior access to the Father, that there is a superior intercession. Well, well, one thing I'd like to suggest to you is if you've managed to get a chance sometime this week, can I suggest to you to, to at some stage read through chapter 6 to 10 of Hebrews, which really deal as a whole with the priesthood of Jesus. I, I potted about different verses this morning, but it's, it would be great for you just to get a whole feel of it. But secondly, as we think of Jesus, and his offering, and we're, we're going to be breaking bread together soon, and this is a, a, a good time to, to test our own hearts and bring this to him again, is this. Trust in Jesus' sin offering and absolutely nothing else for your acceptance with a holy God. 
And thirdly and finally, go to Jesus, your great high priest, with all your needs. You need go to no one else. There is no one better to go to. Go to Jesus today, tomorrow, or all week, with all of your needs. Well, Nathan's going to to lead us in communion shortly, but before that, let's sing together that uh, great hymn that speaks of Jesus as priesthood before the throne of God above. taking communion after hearing about Christ as our great high priest. Um, before we do, I'll uh, just pray for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided for us a, in, in Jesus, that great high priest. Um, we thank you that because of Jesus, there's no need to... Um, keep on sacrificing animals or bringing um, broken offerings from our broken world, but that Christ is um, before your throne, uh, that he intercedes for us, that he can show you the, the scars in, in his hands and his feet and in his side, and that you are more than satisfied uh, with what he's done. And that he can, he can plead our case before you and you hear and listen. And because you take delight in him, then we can have confidence when we come before you that you hear us. Father, as we gather as a, as a family to partake in this meal, um, I pray that by your spirit you'll be present amongst us. And that we would remember and, and celebrate the death and resurrection of our great high priest. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
moment. I'll just read from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul talks about um, the, the Lord's Supper or communion. Um, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <coughs> so then, whoever eats this bread and drinks this, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. Before we go any further, let's just spend a couple of minutes just quietly um, asking the Lord to examine us, to show what we need to repent of, and uh, and just ask the Lord to forgive us before we eat. Let's uh, just have to be quiet for a couple of minutes. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the forgiveness, the full forgiveness that we receive um, because of Christ. Father, I pray that by your Spirit you bring anything that is in our hearts that we need to repent of, that we need to bring before you and ask for forgiveness, Lord, that you would do that now. And Father, I pray that you would... Um, Bless this this bread, this symbol of, of the broken body of Christ and the and the wine, the symbol of His shed blood. That you would bless that to us, and that we would be receive it with thankful and grateful hearts, because our sins have been forgiven because of what Christ has done on the cross. So, Father, would you come and take the glory in our lives? In Jesus' name, Amen. All right. Um, so the the communion meal. That's because that's where it is. It was done that you know Jesus had it as part of his, you know, in the Bible in the the title that the um, the people who translated it called it the Last Supper, um, the meal he had with his disciples, and he said that he was longing for, desiring to have that meal with his disciples, um, knowing what was going to be happening um, almost as soon as that meal was finished, um, and it's a meal for believers, for people who have um, acknowledged. Um, their sin and also acknowledge Christ as their great high priest. Um, so if you're here this morning and you know you're, you're not a Christian, um, don't be embarrassed to let the um, bread and the, the wine pass you by. Um, but instead, use this time to, to call upon the high priest, because believe it or not, he's not too busy. Even though we're doing communion, he's got plenty of spare capacity to listen to you praying whilst we're doing this. And if you are a Christian but you're not yet baptized, um, our tradition here is we ask that you be, be baptized before you take communion. So again, um, if you're a Christian but waiting to get baptized, just let the 
uh, the bread and the wine pass you by and use the time to thank God for the fact that you are saved, you are in, in Christ and, um, and make a mental note to come and badger as elders to get you baptised as quickly as possible. Um, we've got a hymn to sing two verses, is that right? Oh, when I looked at it on the thing, it only had two. Oh, four verses, right, there we go, see. I'll, I'll teach me to try and read. Um, so if we do two verses whilst we distribute the bread, and then we'll <coughs> hold on to the bread, and once everyone's got, we'll, we'll eat together, and then we'll do the last two verses whilst we distribute the wine, and we'll do the same thing, hold on, and then we'll eat together. Um, so if any of the other elders want to come and give me a hand distributing the bread, that would be great. Oh, sorry, stay seated whilst we're distributing the bread. That make it easier.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this meal, um, the symbols of the bread and the wine. We thank you that uh, if it wasn't for Christ, this would just be a, a, a silly thing. Um, but Lord, that because of him, um, this, this bit of bread and this uh, bit of wine has such um, significance to us. And Father, I thank you that uh, we are united in Christ. We are united as family and that we can call you Father. So Father, would you help us to be truly thankful uh, for what Christ did for us on the cross and in leaving that grave empty. So be, again, Lord, come and be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's time for the notices now. Um, for those watching on catch-up, this is the end of the service. Thank you so much for watching.